friends as well. And uh, just, boy, I'll tell you, in the, the things that are going on in this world, it just seems like we really need to have the ability to rise above the craziness in this world. Amen? And, and sometimes it seems difficult to do so. Sometimes we find ourselves right in the middle of just getting, feel like, you know what, the other morning, or a couple days ago, there was a fog that came over Route 6. It was the craziest thing ever. It was kind of like there was no fog. In fact, it was, yeah, it was Friday, yeah. There was no fog. I came to the church here, got ready for devotion, went back. We had our devotion. There was no fog. And then it just set in. In fact, I put something in the fireplace at the house, and Rhonda said, did you light the house on fire? Because looking out the window of the house, there was just this crazy fog. And actually, I started, I actually went outside because I thought I may have done that. So anyhow, that's a whole other story. But, but there was this crazy fog that set in. And my brother was coming in, into town here, and he drove through it. And he said it was the craziest thing ever. He couldn't see where he was going. And I thought, you know what? That's what our lives are like sometimes. It feels like everything was clear, and then suddenly you're just completely in this funk of fog. And it's a crazy thing because we need to rise above that, right? We need to rise above that. And we can do that. We can do that because, you know, there's always an opportunity. God's always doing something that gives us an opportunity to rise above, to see something different than what we typically see. And when we see something different, when we get an opportunity to understand that God does stuff in people's lives that's amazing, but he does it supernaturally, see? He does it in a way that he's able to give us the ability to see life differently than others see it, but he does it supernaturally. I have a video clip here. It was really moving when I, when I seen it. It was back in 2019. Uh, I just wanted to show this clip, and, and we'll go from there. Guys? If you truly are sorry, I know I can speak for myself. I... I forgive you, and I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not going to say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I see, I, I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't going to ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I'm not gonna say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes.
I don't know if you remember that. Looks a little different than the setting you have in America today, amen? A little bit different. It's powerful. The situation was that that police officer, the woman there, had come home. She went to the wrong floor, walked into an apartment she thought was her own. There was a black male in the home in this place, which was his. She told, gave him commands. He didn't obey him. She shot him and killed him right in his own home. The brother, that was the brother's testimony right there. Of a, that was a, that was a impact statement from the brother, a victim impact statement, and he obviously not only forgave this woman, but it was a very powerful moment, to say the least. Judge Kemp that was in that courtroom that day also was deeply moved, came from the bench. I don't know if any of you have seen that on television. Came from the bench and gave that woman her personal Bible, right? Prayed with her and embraced her in that courtroom. Took a ton of heat for that, too. There was people saying all sorts of negative things about that. Let me just tell you something about the two characters there. You know, when you hear a, a victim statement from somebody that can, that can do something like that so moving with the loss of a loved one, and then a judge who just uh, handed down a 10-year sentence for this individual to embrace in that manner, that's powerful. I mean, that's huge, powerful. You have to say, what in the world would promote something like that? I've got something, and you know what, I just feel like sometimes the Lord gives me a word and, it, and it's, you know, it encompasses a period of time. And, and as a result of that, it's just like there's a word to really be taken away today. And I really feel like you're going to hear it tonight. It's found in Colossians chapter 3. I used part of this in a, one of our devotions this week with our men. I actually today used one verse of it in our devotion before our pantry. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 and following says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly love, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell in you richly, as you teach, admonish one another with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs, and the Spirit singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do. Whether it in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That's heavy duty. That about covers everything there. I want to just read through that list of virtues. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with each other, forgive one another, and if any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And then it goes on to say, and all of these virtues put on love, which binds them all together perfectly. Perfectly. Well, that's a mouthful. You know, we get going in this world and, and we feel victimized at times. The circumstances around us, they're hard to deal with, to say the least. And so we go on and we try to do things the best that we can. Amen. We forget there's a bigger mission going on in, in our lives than just to go along to get along. We're actually on a mission that God calls us to in, in the fruit of this whole thing. If you can imagine, if we wanted to accomplish something that would be amazing, it would be that we would be in perfect unity as the church. Amen? That would be an amazing thing, to be in perfect unity. The first of those virtues, of course, was compassion. Matthew 9, 35 through 38 says, Jesus went through all of the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and, the, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, 
like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send in the workers to the harvest field. And I thought, boy, I'll tell you what, compassion. Compassion is what Jesus always showed. Compassion is the picture that's an amazing thing that Christ displayed before us. And he always had this mission in mind. And if you think of the disciples when they, when they didn't comprehend what was going on with the, the woman at the well, in the middle of the day, she's out there getting water and the disciples come back. Jesus is speaking to a Samaritan woman and they don't understand the, the magnitude of what's happening. And he tells them, there's, you say there's three months to harvest. I tell you, look, the fields are ripe for harvest now, right? Right in front of their eyes. In the midst of everything going on, Jesus tells us that we should call to the Lord of the harvest to bring in the workers. And I think that might be our prayer tonight, amen? That maybe we'd see ourselves as one of the workers instead of having grievance against a brother. The next one is kindness. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, 23 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control against such things there is no law you can imagine the fruits of the spirit the fruits of the spirit kindness it's a fruit of the spirit we can learn something from that humility first peter 5 5 in the same way you are younger submit yourselves to your elders all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because god opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Well, that's something we could learn from, amen? God resists the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Humility is something we're supposed to clothe, clothe ourselves in. Boy, what a contrast it is when we're trying to promote our own agendas. When we're out there in the middle of the fog and we're trying to fight our way through, hitting it, swinging, this thing of flaying your arms around just aimlessly and hitting whatever you might hit. Instead of, asking the Lord to help us through what we don't have any idea how to navigate. James 4, 6 says this, but he gives us more grace. That is why the scripture said God opposes the proud and shows favor to the humble. God gives us grace to be able to do the things that he calls us to do. He gives us grace, undeserved favor. In the midst of, you know, you're having a really hard time with somebody that's completely unreasonable, and he gives us the ability. He gives us grace. James 4.10 says this, Humble yourselves there before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Boy, isn't it hard sometimes to think that maybe if I just calm down before God, maybe ask him, God, what do you want to accomplish in and through these circumstances right now? What do you want to do in my life right now? And in that place of great humility before God, he lifts us up. It's an amazing thing because, of course, the opposite of that is that he, is that he would resist us. And I don't think there's anybody that wants that. The resisting hand of God. You know, you know unlike the, uh, the school uh, policies of uh, Illinois, that you... Nobody gets held back. You just move forward no matter where you're at. Guess what? That don't work with God. That doesn't work with God. Right? If he's teaching you something, you will learn it under his terms. Amen? How about gentleness? Gentleness. Galatians 5, and 23 again. Listen to this. Fruits of the Spirit, if we exercise them, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and what? Guess what? Gentleness. It's a fruit of the Spirit. The next one of these things we're not going to like very much is patience. Patience. Ecclesiastics 7, 9 says this. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, 
present your request to God. Of course, you know what that goes on to say. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen? But when we're in the middle of it, it doesn't work that easy, does it? Amen? Anybody want to be bold enough to say that? Do not be anxious about anything but in every situation by prayer and petition. And then that with thanksgiving, in the craziness of my circumstances, with thanksgiving present my request to God. Crazy. Galatians 6, 9. Dave's favorite. Let us not become weary in doing good in the proper time. We'll reap the harvest if we don't give up. Patience. And then my soapbox is James 1, 20, James 1, 2 through 4. It says, consider pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance complete its work that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Crazy. Patience. That's a virtue. And then how about bear with one another in the circumstances that are going on. We're going to carry that load together. Galatians 6, 2, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Wow. Heavy duty, huh? Forgive one another. How about this? Matthew 6, 14. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. How about that? Boy, we want to be forget. We want all. We want all the blessings of God. We want all His favor. You know, you think about the wicked servant. You know, that was forgiven all those things beyond what he could ever pay back. Then he goes out and finds some poor soul that owes him a day's wage and and has him thrown in prison because he didn't pay back what he owes. And the king raged in anger. Right? Imagine what God thinks about us with the pettiness of our heart at times when he's done so much in our lives and he says, now I want you to be an accurate picture of Jesus with your life. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive each other just as Christ, as in Christ God forgave you. And listen to this. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Wow. Put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. You know, it's a very difficult thing to do what we do. As Christian people, in the process of everything we do, it seems like the hardest thing to do is have genuine love displayed through our lives. You know, selfless love, selfless love, not selfish love, selfless love. You know, that's the kind of love that Jesus displayed to us, right? John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Amen? Wow. I just, tonight, I don't know, I just feel like there's so much that we can learn and that we can really, really comprehend if we begin to really try to live these things. This picture of love, John 13, 34, and 35, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Did you hear that? Those are the words of Jesus. You understand, we have the Great Commission, right? We're supposed to go out and make disciples, right? We're supposed to teach everybody the things that we learned, right? Of course, the hope is that the provision that God has given us that would give us eternal life in Christ Jesus would be extended to those who are out in this world looking for the authentic relationship that only can be found in God through Christ, seen through our lives, and it's displayed with authentic love. Authentic love, right? The love that Jesus gave us, and we struggle to display that because we have the world's definition of love that's our reference point, right? 
The world's definition of love is very, it's not even love, it's lust. That's the mainstream marketing of America, lust. How, what does this do for me? What's in this for me, right? Quite a contrast to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 and following says, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. It does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes, and it always perseveres. Amen? That's quite a picture, isn't it? When I look at it, I'm just like, boy, that's a report card I'm not interested in to see what my grade is on that one. Who's cackling? Is that you, Andy? No? Oh, okay, it's Tim. I resemble that remark. But it's true, isn't it? When you look at it, you know, every time I read through that whole list, I just think that's the attributes of Jesus, isn't it? It's a selfless love, not selfish love. It's a beautiful picture. And it's by that love that we're told that this world will see, they'll know that we're Jesus, that we're his, by our love for one another. The authenticity of the journey is witnessed by a lost world, by our love for one another. And, it, and it's just like, you know, it's like trying to throw a pass in a ball game, and it, it's, every time it's incomplete. At some point, we ought to get a little better and have a little bit more strategy to see some really good plays, amen? The God wants us to maybe really take this and let it penetrate a little deeper. It's, it's not that hard to understand. We make it very difficult to understand. So Colossians 3, 15 through 17 says this, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. It says, as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wow. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Wow. Baraburo is the Greek word for rule. That word right there is an amazing word because... <clears throat> when I think of everything that we've talked about so far, can you pull me down just a little bit, guys? When I think about that word, rule, rule in your heart, literally translated, it means it would be like umpire or referee of our heart. You know, we were watching our team, our basketball team play. They, they were amazing. And watching, you know, whatever the ref says, you're done. You know, whatever the guy says, you're done. Now, there's people having issues. There's one on the floor, and there's all this stuff going on. But with God, guess what? He's the final word, amen? And so when you think in terms of referee or umpire, when they make a call, you're done, right? So if you think in terms of let the peace of Christ rule your hearts as a done deal. You know, I like to say, one of, a pastor buddy of mine in Colorado, he debunks all these crazy sayings that people have that, you know, you know, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And he says, no, it's God said it, that settles it. Whether you believe it or not has no bearing on it whatsoever. Amen? And so when you think about this, when you think in terms of letting the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, if you're trying to navigate the things you're doing in life based on trying to just live day to day, add a little God to it like seasoning on your life, and think you're going to make it and do things effectively with the peace of God, right? Ruling in your heart, you're delirious. You're completely delirious. In fact, you'll be more frustrated than you've ever been. Because you know what the Bible says? If you know Jesus as Savior, if you've received that forgiveness of Christ, guess what? The work that he began in you, he's faithful to bring it to completion. 
So he'll continually be working, doing that, bringing it to completion, and you're fighting him going in another direction because you got your own agenda, you got your own plans, and so on and so forth. You're starting to look at people in which we're supposed to have a forgiving heart. We look at them and understand they're a work in progress just like we're a work in progress. Amen? And so if, if somebody's annoying me or if I'm you know, having a problem with somebody, then I'm probably doing that to someone else too, right? And so let me just tell you, if you're, if you're the annoyance, if you're being an annoyance, act like you got some sense and get that right. Amen? We don't just get a, you know, oh, you know what, I'm probably annoying somebody else. They're annoying me. People annoy me, so I can go ahead and annoy people. That's just, that's ridiculous. We're supposed to be, all of us, very aware that we are part of the body of Christ. Amen? Jesus being the head. Amen? And if that's the case, and we're supposed to be part of the body of Christ, you know, the mentality so many times that happens is we get aggravated with each other, kind of like if you stub your toe into an end table, you don't chop it off, do you? Right, Andy? No? Okay. You don't chop it off. You probably are going to take your hand and rub it, aren't you? And, and, and if you have an ailment in your body, you're probably going to tend to the rest of the body. And the reality is, is we are the body of Christ in in. Everything that goes on in our mind affects the actions that we're involved in. So when we think in terms of what goes on in our actions is a direct result of what we allowed in our mind that made its way to our heart, that became an action, that became a habit, that became a lifestyle. Amen? And so when you're thinking in terms of letting the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, the difference in walking in that kind of peace is understanding that I cannot do that and be the captain of my own ship. Are you with me? You can't. Because all the instruction we got through that passage right there to let these things be present in my life are contingent on me submitting to the lordship of Jesus in every area of my life. Are you with me? Because if I decide I'm not, this right here, I'm, I, don't, I don't like the fact that I'm supposed to be forgiving in these situations, right? This person's got me aggravated and I'm just going to go home with that and I'm going to leave it. And, that, and, I'm the, and maybe one day I might get to a different point and, and have a different attitude. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Do you know what? You're a prisoner to that. Do you understand that? Hearing people that have struggled in this area right here, forgiveness, it's a huge one. There's people that have been aggravated with somebody for so many years that the person dies and they're still mad at them. And the only person living in that pain anymore is the one hanging on to that. Right? And let me just give you a tip. Let me just give you a tip. The people who hurt you that you need to forgive, that's for us. That's a gift from God for us. Because you want to know what? These people, a lot of these people that do things that are vicious and mean, I promise you, they're not thinking about you. They're on to victimizing somebody else and, and so on and so forth. And the reality of it is, is we find the place to be able to be a, a reflection of the Jesus in us when we comprehend what he's forgiven us for and just walk away. Just say, you know what, Lord? That one's on you. You deal with that. And I'm going to move forward. I'm just going to let go of it, right? That's yours. And then start thinking about what does God really want to do as he frees us through these circumstances? If the peace of Christ is richly ruling our hearts, right? If you have this peace in the midst of craziness, people do you wrong. You know, when I think of the picture of Jesus, Jesus did so many things that gave us a vivid picture into the freedom that was found in Jesus. Jesus had a cross to contend with, amen? He came from a manger to a cross, and that was his mission. And it was concluded when he came out of that tomb on the third day, amen? But listen, he had to deal with things. He had to deal with real situations every day. He had to deal with hurts that were very real. And if he didn't keep his mind on the reality of what was being accomplished, he would have got lost in the same pains that we got lost, that we get lost in. 
Someone would have did something and he'd have been hung up on it. Instead of realizing, you know what? Jesus is the one that says, if somebody asks you to walk a mile, walk two. You know, if they slap you in the face, turn the other cheek. Amen? Amen. You know, the picture is always of the restoring ability of, of something that happens like that. If you'd imagine, you're slapped in the face and you turn the other cheek. It's an open door for what? Reconciliation. Yeah. Are you with me? So when you think in terms of what does that look like in our everyday life? What does it look like to embody what you're hearing today? So I've been working on this during the week with the guys. I've, I've come in at a different angles, uh, you know, just trying to really get a hold of this right here. Letting the peace of Christ really get a hold of us, right? Our hearts. So that in the midst of craziness, when somebody does you wrong, we have an attitude to turn the other cheek. To say, maybe this is the time. Maybe this is the time that God's going to change the circumstances right now. You know what's interesting? I, I witnessed something years and years ago. And it was at a time in my life that, you know, it was crazy. I wasn't walking with the Lord like I should have been. But I heard somebody say something and I never forgot it. Somebody was dealing with a situation that the parents, the parents, so it was a husband and wife deal, and the parents of the guy, right? The parents of the guy had given up on him a long time ago. And so the wife, the wife was just steadfast, just trying to, to work this thing out. And so, and I'm in the middle of it because there were drugs in the middle of it, and so I was in the middle of it trying to help somebody right so what happens is the parent finally just flips and says you know what you know when are you gonna just let this thing go this is who he is you know this is what it's gonna be and that's the way it is and you know and that's the way it is and this lady says you know what I haven't tried today I haven't tried today. <laughs> I was like, wow, wow. And now if I, if I unpack the big picture of what was going on in these people's lives, which I'm not going to do that, but that was a huge statement. I mean, it was huge. But it was a picture thinking about, you know, I just want to make this work, and I don't know what the motives were, but I was thinking, you know, it's never left me because I thought, wow, is that not a picture of what Jesus does with us. You know, that he just keeps coming back, giving us opportunity to respond to his love and his care and to a mission. You see, his love and his care and his persistence to finish the work that he began in us is not just to say, look, okay, finally you submitted and this is where you ended up. It's not about that. It's about that there's a mission and that his love for us was so great that he came from a place in heaven to be born of a virgin in a manger, to die on a cross, and the price is paid, that work is finished, when he bowed his head and said, it is finished, it was done, and the rest of it was up to God the Father, and he walked out of that tomb on the third day. But that's been paid for already. And he's invited us to be partnering in inviting others with our lives, to be, that to be seen through our lives here on this earth. And you cannot do that with turmoil in your life. Because you know why? Because people are looking at us, they say, what do you have that I don't have? Why should I listen to anything you have to say? Your life's a mess. And then you'd have to say, well, what is my pursuit? How come the peace of Christ is not dwelling richly in my heart? What's the problem? We'll start chasing that dog back from the tail end, right? And you'll find the problem probably going to be the pursuits we find ourselves in. Amen? We're probably going to go down our little list there and we're going to start looking at some things and we'll say, hey, I see a problem. Yeah, I got some issues. They, they're big. I don't have any compassion, right? My kindness isn't very kind, right? I don't have any humility. I'm a proud, arrogant something or another. My gentleness isn't very apparent to anybody 
and I'm not very patient at all. I don't bear with anybody their burdens, right? I don't forgive people very easily. I have grievances that I can see everybody else's faults, but I certainly can't see mine, right? And I certainly don't put a virtue calls love out there as a banner to be waved in front of them. Amen? So what if we did an inventory? What if we said legitimately before God, what if we said, God, I really want to get this. You know, I really want to get this. I want to have, you know, the peace of Christ rule in my heart. I recognize that I'm part of the body of Christ. And I want the message of Christ to dwell among the body richly. The message of Christ. Can you imagine the message of Christ? It's a selfless love being expressed through the entirety of the body of Christ, being seen to a lost world that they would identify. That being done, what? Richly. Amen? If that was the case, can you imagine? Could you imagine the impact in people's lives when that's experienced legitimately? So, where is it with, with you tonight? I mean, where do you find yourself? Are the things you're doing, whether in word and deed, all done in the name of the Lord Jesus? See, these are the things that I sit around, and not just because I'm a pastor, but because I believe that there's a calling that's bigger than just coming to church or being in Bible studies. You know, I'm absolutely consumed with the, the reality. The Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required, and I'm consumed with that thought. I've been rescued from a mess. And because of that, God's given me the opportunity to speak to others to say, listen, here's the opportunities that we have. However, if you stay in the mess you're in, you cannot help someone else. But if the evidence of Christ and what he does in our life, the indwelling of Jesus, you know, when the Bible tells us, do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? You'll be able to test and approve what God's will is as good as pleasing his perfect will. When we actually allow that to happen and the word gets into us and you know what happens? We start having convictions in our heart and I say, you know what, I can't live like this anymore. I, I don't want to live like this anymore. Why? Because it's stench and I don't want it in my world anymore. I want there to be some kind of legitimacy to who I am. I don't want to be stuck in the mess that I used to be. And I want to walk in the newness that comes in Christ. Amen? But we have to make a decision at some point. You have to be putting off the old and putting on the new. Amen? It's a displacement process. It's not going to Bible study and hearing words and just allowing them to hit and bounce around inside your head and they don't go any deeper. It's legitimately saying, God, you know what? I have a problem. I don't have compassion in my heart, but I want to experience what Jesus did. When he looked out on the multitudes and he wept, I want to experience that, and I'm not there. You hear what I'm telling you? It's crying out and saying, I'm not patient. I'm a person that wants everything right now, and I'm not patient. God, I want to embody the patience that you have with me. in praying it with a legitimate position from where you are. But I'm going to tell you, I, I don't know where you're at tonight. I don't know where you are spiritually. And every time I come before anybody and have the opportunity to speak, I always say, listen, you have an opportunity to make a difference right now. No matter where you're at. No matter where you are spiritually. Because if you're on the outside of the forgiveness that God has given us in Christ... That's where it begins. It begins by saying, God, I recognize I'm a sinner and I know I can't. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So it begins with redemption through the blood of Jesus. If you've never did that, you need to do that. That's the beginning of a journey. And I'm telling you, it'll rock your world. It took a drug smuggling and an outlaw problem and turn them into somebody that's heart is broken over somebody else's pain. You hear what I'm telling you? But the reality of it is, as you go down that road, and it's not just, okay, I've done this. It's like you don't, you don't get a shower and climb right back into your dirty clothes and go back into the mess you came from. 
It's allowing him to do a transformation of who we are, right? It's believing you're a new creature in Christ. He wants to do an amazing thing in your life, right? The old is gone and the new has come, right? And so if, if you find yourself at a place that you're convicted in your heart, you say, God, those things in that list, you know, the, those virtues, they're not present, they're not live and well, and your word says they're a fruit of the Spirit, most of them. And they're not live in my life. I got a problem, man. I don't even see the buds on that tree. Then it starts by getting before him and saying, God, change my heart. Help me to let go of the things that are binding me to that life. I don't want it no more. Agree with them, because that's what repentance is, right? Repentance is when we turn our hearts, when we agree with God. We say, I don't have the answers, God, but you do. And on that note, I'm going to take your hand and you lead me. Wherever you find yourself, counselors come forward. As this music plays, you have an opportunity to respond. You ask God, say, listen, you know what? Somewhere in the middle of everything that went on here tonight, I'm in there. I can't even sort down to the bottom of it. But I want to. I want to begin a journey, God, that you're leading me the way. That I get the heck out of the way and let you lead. Wherever you find yourself at this time of invitation, as the music plays, would you come? shackles and chains I've been freed and forgiven I'm not going back and I'll never be the same that's why I sing all my hope is in Jesus thank God Broken more than a time or two, yes, Lord. But He picked me up and showed me what it means to live. That's why I sing, All my hope is in Jesus. Thank God, my yesterday's gone. All my 
Father God, we thank you for another day. God, thank you for the opportunities that you give us. We're praying for your hand upon our hearts when we go from this place today, that we take what you've given us here today and we'd allow you to do a work in us that as a result, the world would see the Jesus that died on that cross for us instead of the frailties and the imperfect infractions that they might want to point out. Instead, let them see Jesus. Let it be so. Be glorified in the intent of our heart. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>